it broke barriers as it built a new world. It was absolutely a leap of faith because nobody had done it before. And went head to head with the most successful game of its kind. It actually scared us too because we're thinking, oh, there's probably going to be room for one and that's it. Building this brave new world wasn't easy. I don't know. If I hadn't seen the game from the beginning, I probably would have been pretty skeptical. Yet the results were breathtaking. In a way, it's like our world, except it's in a fantasy setting. Real life relationships began forming. You make friends in this game, and these are friends that you keep for a long time. And make-believe characters came to life. A mother sent in a picture of her daughter and said, my daughter looks exactly like this. You've got to use her. But the extreme dedication of some players caused controversy. I know for myself at one point, I just actually had to stop the addiction and, and get out of it so I could keep my life and keep my sanity. This is the amazing story of EverQuest, the most successful massively multiplayer online role-playing game in history. It just keeps going and going like the Energizer Bunny. By the mid-1990s, a Sony product development group, now known as Sony Online Entertainment, has achieved success on the PlayStation platform with the NFL Game Day. <laughs> Twisted Metal. And Jet Moto titles. But not every release is a success. It was a shame with Spawn, though, because I've always been a big Spawn fan. After a troubled, multi-year production process, Spawn the Eternal is released. In spite of high hopes, the game, based on the comic book classic, fails miserably. And Spawn was an especial favorite because of its cutting-edge uh, art and storylines. And then the, when the game was so pitiful, it was like, oh, you broke my heart. Yet other hits follow, including sequels to Jet Moto and Twisted Metal. Both offer modes of play for multiple gamers. Ha! Ah, the race to broaden multiplayer entertainment officially begins. It was something that I felt very strongly about. I, I really believed in, in online gaming from the start. I was playing a game called Cyber Strike at the time from a company called Simutronics and just fell in love with it. But his love for online games takes a personal toll. I was just married at the time. My wife was killing me. We were getting $600 a month bills, and she just, she just wanted to kill me for this because it was hourly pay-for-play on Genie back in those days. And what happened was, I, as, I, as I fell in love with Internet gaming, I more and more wanted to see my, my tabletop Dungeons & Dragons days from high school kind of become a reality. Smedley approaches his boss at Sony. He wants to create an online fantasy world unlike any other. A game that can be played only by subscription. Actually, at that time, uh, my old boss, Kelly Flock, back in 97 when I first uh, hit him up with this idea, he was really supportive of it. And it's not very often that you find a company that's willing to take a risk, a real flyer. Because we're talking about days when there was no real uh, pay-for-play business. It was limited to people like me that were willing to, to pay for it. It was absolutely a leap of faith because nobody had done it before. And as much as everybody might believe that, well, yeah, this, of course people will pay $10 a month to play this game. Whether they actually will or not, um, you, you rely so heavily then on the content of the game, uh, aside from anything else, uh, that core game quality has to be there. Back in March of 97, I hired Brad McQuaid and Steve Clover. It's kind of a funny story. I was browsing the web looking for programmers, and I was, I was looking through shareware games because I had in my head that I wanted to get an online role-playing game going. Honestly, I, it was no more than an idea, and I was fortunate enough to run across uh, Brad McQuaid and Steve Clover. He came out with the idea of putting this stuff together and got together with Brad McQuaid, who was designing this project. And they said in the early days when still internet gaming was kind of a buzz, but it really wasn't, nobody was convinced at this point. 
Work on the new game continues. But in September 1997, Ultima Online, the first commercial online game, is released by Origin. How would this affect Sony's ambitious project? I think that may have been either the first E3 or the last CES. We actually heard about Ultima Online at that time. It's an amazing looking game and, and we were like, oh wow, this is cool. This, now we'll have an example of, of something that, that's going to be fun to play. Ultima Online really did pave the way for it in, the, in its graphical sense and bringing this, a, a fantasy world to life in a, in a real strong graphical sense. Before Ultima Online, it was all text based. We had no idea if it'd be a commercial success or not. I mean, certainly we all played the Ultimates growing up, and knowing that, that it had that brand behind it actually scared us too, because we're thinking, oh, there's probably going to be room for one, and that's it. Ultima Online soon has more than 90,000 players. But Sony is planning a response. In spring 1998, Tanarus, Sony's first online subscription game, originally created as an experiment, is released to test the online waters. It was quickly cobbled together just to, to demonstrate to uh, the higher-ups that John's vision was going to work and that the engine that we had acquired from Pyrotechnics was going to be functional. Tanneris does more than just function. It's fun to play. Tanneris is a... Uh, a tank game made of teams. There's no real complicated scenarios involved. You just get in your tank, drive, and try and kill the other guy before he kills you. It's a lot of fun. And we built an internet game that really became kind of the, the cornerstone of our entire online gaming experience. By the spring of 1998, the video game world is entranced by Ultima Online. It was nearly at the peak of its power. Ultima had the benefit of its cachet as a world. The Britannia world that Richard Garriott had built was something that a lot of fans in the game industry had really already tapped into. We were able to watch this thing launch and become a success, and it really took on a life of its own, and then we knew we had something at that point. Yet Sony sees an opportunity to build on their competitor's success. Ultima Online served a very specific uh, audience. They had, it, it was a great game, I played it much too much myself, but it, it was a great game that had a lot going for it, but it also had some small negatives that not everybody was into it. Sony Online Entertainment has already begun work on a game that will challenge the authority of Ultima Online. A game that will become a lifestyle for enthusiasts worldwide. By 1998, Ultima Online is the top internet game of its kind. Sony Online Entertainment is getting ready to go head-to-head -head with its own entry. The new massively multiplayer online role-playing game is dubbed EverQuest. It will be set in a breathtaking 3D fantasy world, a persistent world that never shuts down. We've never done this before. Tanners was our only experience and it was very limited compared to the scope of an EverQuest. So it was just a lot of uh, trial by fire and trial by error. It was a major risk, there's no doubt. There had never been a, even an attempt to do a game like this, which is a true 3D engine, massively multiplayer, persistent world, online role-playing game. Players can assume characters of infinite types. The game features 12 different races of humans, gnomes, elves, and other creatures. You can go into it adopt a new identity. You can be whoever you want to be. The connection with your character that you created was immediate, that you could really start building up and exploring and people struggled through the hard times because at the core of this was, this was new, this was just a lot of fun. The online world of EverQuest is called Norath. From a first or third person perspective, players can explore continents ranging from steaming jungle swamps to underwater lands. In a way, it's like our world, except it's in a fantasy setting. It has an economy. It has a social structure. It's just not our world. Within Norath, players traverse many different zones 
and pool resources in quests for distant treasures. The global environment and the artistic results are astonishing. EverQuest is all about people interacting with other people. Their experience just fighting monsters, that's fun. It's when they start getting their friends involved, that's when something just seems to click because you're working towards a common goal. A lot of people in the hardcore that started with the game had probably come to this because it was sort of Dungeons and Dragons style experience that they've had it on the tabletop now visualized. You get the magic through the fact that it's suddenly real, it's suddenly more diverse, and it's suddenly interactive. And this interactivity is key to what makes this new game unique. You're fighting a monster and a friend of yours joins in. And all of a sudden you've got somebody you know and maybe they've invited somebody else to join your group and now you've got three people and all of a sudden you're introduced to this new person. It just keeps going and going like the Energizer Bunny. I mean, you just get this huge network of people that you meet and I think that's the magic. Yet one of the game's most unique aspects causes concern. In Ultima Online, players often battle or PK fellow players for sport. So with EverQuest, they decided to go with player versus environment. It was very controversial when it was announced during the development that we were going to go towards player versus environment rather than player versus player. So a concession is made. The hardcore player versus player people were really upset because they wanted to show that they're the best player, we have the best skills, and the way to prove that is against another player and not against an artificial intelligence. So we also included there are some servers where you, it is player versus player, where you can actually kill another player in the game. The game is making headway. But will people actually pay a monthly fee to play it? We had these project review meetings, and all the other producers would show these PlayStation games that are going to sell a million units. NFL game day, million units. And here we are showing our PC stuff. Uh, how many is this going to sell? Well, we think it might sell 70,000 units over two years. I don't know. Uh, I myself, if I hadn't seen the game from the beginning, I probably would have been pretty skeptical. And then all of a sudden, some of those producers internally started uh, playing the game, and then they got it. It's just one of this big ball of energy that kind of sucks people in. Yet is it good enough to impress the press? When EverQuest launched, they were fighting the Ultima name, and they were also fighting the Lord British name. Uh, it, had, it had some celebrity behind it. Uh, so that was a tough road to hoe. I remember hauling these big computers up to Computer Gaming World and, and literally kind of getting these almost not blank stares, but sort of like they didn't know quite what to make of us yet. I actually saw the game well before release when John Smedley and Brad McQuay came in and said, we've got this game and it's going to be massively multiplayer and it's an RPG. There was a lot of nervousness about it, but I remember I was working at PC Accelerator at the time and we first got our builds of EverQuest in and all of a sudden we just got sucked into it. And the positive reaction keeps building well after its March 1999 introduction. After only two months on the market, more than 100,000 copies of the CD-ROM are sold. And each night, 30,000 people enter the enthralling zones of EverQuest. When it first launched, it was a real test because, yeah, nobody had done this before. And Ultima Online had already come out and set a, an example and a standard. And I think that there was a feeling for a while that between Ultima Online and EverQuest and Asheron's Call, the market was somewhat saturated. But with each additional game that's come into the market, it's a, it has expanded the base. When we launched the product in uh, early 1999, we had a roughly 50,000 subscribers within a two or three month period. EverQuest players are supported by a team of game masters who are based in the company's headquarters in San Diego, California. We'll doggedly go after a problem until we solve it. One of our employees will spend half a day, if necessary, with one single customer to resolve a situation, if necessary. Fans go crazy for this brand new fantasy world. During peak periods, there are up to 37,000 players online simultaneously. From countries as far flung as Zimbabwe and New Zealand. People operate in their mundane world, and then EverQuest allows them to operate in a fantasy world where they can do fantastic things. Our typical player plays 20 hours a week, which is a lot. And the ramp-up curve that we see on this game is absolutely amazing. It goes from, you know, a couple hours a week 
to all of a sudden they just go right up to our average, and in some cases a lot more than that. Nuts. They are absolutely intense. It is amazing, but I think it, it comes out of the fact that they have dedicated so much of their time and often taken over their lives to this. Given the strongly addictive nature of EverQuest, the gaming press and online community jokingly nicknamed the game EverQuest. I know for myself at one point I just actually had to stop the addiction and, and get out of it, you know, so I could keep my life and keep my sanity. You know, I would say that people devote like 38 hours of their week to TV. Is that bad? Yes, I think I'm a proof of that. Do people devote too much of their days to this? I think that's a personal choice. It's about what people want to do with their free time. You know, EverQuest really just became a phenomenon because it empowers people to communicate online. The kind of catchphrase that we like to use, it's, it's we're forming global gaming community. You make friends in this game, and these are friends that you keep for a long time. Great to have all you guys here. It's about time we got here, huh? And what better place to meet than at EverQuest Fan Fairs? We host a quarterly fan fair, which is a national traveling EverQuest get together. They come primarily because they want to meet their online counterparts face to face. Fantasy begins merging with reality. Yeah, oh my gosh. I mean, how cool is that? I think I must have bought every single TV guide in our local grocery store. And the cover girl becomes a real-life woman. Our artist Keith Parkinson painted the first uh, EverQuest, and the high elf Furiana V that's on the, the cover of the first box, a mother sent in a picture of her daughter and said, my daughter looks exactly like this. You've got to use her. And Keith started using her as a model for the future ones. In fact, if you look closely, the difference between the, the first box and the second, it goes from looking like this kind of generic high elf to Denise. Within months of its launch, EverQuest outpaces Ultima Online, its biggest competitor. But can it survive newer, tougher competition, as well as its own replacement? In December 1999, EverQuest becomes the best-selling massively multiplayer online role-playing game of all time. 250,000 copies of the game have been sold, outpacing its nearest competitors, Ultima Online and Asheron's Call. I'm not sure that there is an average EverQuest player. A good portion of our audience is male. A good portion fits between the ages of 13 and 30. To however old you want to be to play it. At the same time, we have 75-year-old grandmothers in Florida playing with their grandkids out in San Francisco. There's some people that play heavy Dungeons and Dragons and are into the real role-playing side of things. And then you have the, the jocks, like the Kurt Schillings of the world. It really does take a cross-section of people. As many as 40,000 subscribers have logged on to the game at the same time, each paying a $10 a month subscription fee. But fans are restless. We're really there to please the, uh, the ongoing players who've been playing a long time and want some new experience. That's, that's what the expansions are for. In early 2000, the first EverQuest expansion pack is released. <laughs> The Ruins of Kunark includes a new continent to explore and a new race of lizard men. It really helped to uh, give something extra. And it really wasn't just a case of adding a landmass, it was adding a bunch of other elements. The expansion pack is a smash hit, and by February 2000, EverQuest boasts more than 300,000 players. That winter, a second expansion pack, The Scars of Bellius, is introduced. It features even more perilous zones and numerous new quests for characters at higher levels. But some complain that it's too hard for most players. Uh, that was a real high-end pack for those people that have already invested a huge amount of hours. There's always going to be controversy over what we're deciding to do, and, you know, sometimes it works for us, sometimes it doesn't. Nevertheless, EverQuest continues to rule the online gaming world. Sony's most difficult challenge is figuring out how to keep the success going. And the point then becomes not what they actually did, but how you actually manage that going forward. 
The Shadows of Lucklin expansion pack is announced in spring of 2001, created for all levels of ability. It takes players to the eerie moonscape in the Shadows of Lucklin. It's a hit. And you might think, well, why don't you just do that every time? Well, because we have different pins and we can't just make this a cookie cutter, you know, kind of experience that's just generic and all across the spectrum. Leveraging an established leadership in online gaming, Sony Online Entertainment announces plans for three ambitious new online games, including the long-awaited real-time strategy game, Sovereign. One of the things I think I'm really proud of our company is that we're, we're doing groundbreaking things. We're not doing just other versions of EverQuest. That's not the way we want to do business. Planet Side. It's taken us a while. It's not easy to get a first-person shooter that's going to be massively multiplayer. No one's done that yet. And another title that's out of this world. We're the developer on Star Wars Galaxies. We're doing it for the publisher LucasArts. It is a massively multiplayer Star Wars universe. This is truly going to be like going to see a Star Wars movie and walking through the screen. It's going to be as close to a virtual experience uh, as anybody has ever experienced. But as fans like to say, there will always be EverQuest. You'll see Sony Online focusing on bringing our online games to the console market. We also have uh, EverQuest Online Adventures, which were taken to the PlayStation 2. In my opinion, the console gaming is going to be one of the biggest explosions here in the next two or three years. We're working with a company on a real-time translation technology, which, in the simplest form, Somebody in France will type in French and they'll get translated into English on my computer and back and forth. So we're looking to expand French, German, Spanish, Japanese, and Korean. EverQuest 2 is going to be coming out fall 2003. Our plans are to migrate people in such a way that if they want to go to EverQuest 2, they can. The, the game itself is coming along really well. It's going to, I think, redefine where we're trying to go with these games. We're doing unique things like nobody's ever done before. We're aging characters within the game. Over time, you'll be able to manipulate your character such that you visually age in-game. Can you purchase virtual anti-aging cream? <laughs> uh, never mind. More importantly, will there ever be too many online games? I do have concerns that there are too many coming too soon and I really don't know if the market can support all of them or not. Is there room for everyone? I think just like any other market, the consumer's gonna end up telling us who the winners are, and that's the way it should be. So I'm, I'm excited to see The Sims Online come up, and you know, I think it's gonna grow the market. Dark Age of Camelot from Mythic Entertainment has been a huge success, and that's great. Yeah. Anarchy Online has really improved since its launch, and they all offer different game experiences. Amazingly, EverQuest has not been really hit hard by those games coming out. The cream really will rise to the top, and hopefully I think we're going to be leading that. How long will the original live on? There's absolutely no reason why it should stop. There's a new expansion coming out, Planes of Power. EverQuest isn't going away anytime soon. It will live on as long as it's financially reasonable to do so, and I think it's going to be for some time to come. EverQuest has broken records worldwide, but it has also done something much more important. It has formed friendships worldwide. Friendships that transcend the game. To me, if, if people have made friends because of EverQuest, and it's become kind of a part of their lives as they go about their, their everyday lives, if we can be a part of that, I'm really happy and I, and I hope that that's something that we can continue to do and make people feel good about.